Hey, good morning there, freshmen. So um, today we're gonna go over the rock cycle. So I'm gonna be giving this as a lecture in class to my in-person students. For those of you who aren't here, um, this video is here to cover the exact same stuff. The quality of uh, me recording my lecture and whatnot in the front of the room is not gonna be great. So I'm gonna try and do the same thing here. I'm gonna try not to ramble. Um, I apologize if I ramble a little bit. Geology is what I have my degree in. Um, I am a trained geologist, so, um, you know, obviously this stuff is very near and dear to my heart, and I can talk endlessly on it, so I'm going to try and go through this um, pretty quickly without giving you too much detail. Just know the main point of me going through this is to show you how geologists read rocks, and at the very least show you um, kind of like a Dr. Seuss version of how to read a book, right? That's kind of what we're getting into when we're looking at the rock cycle and rocks. It's the kind of the Dr. Seuss of how to read rocks is what you're getting today. So you're not getting all the complex vocabulary and all the very complicated um, other you know, concepts and things that uh, you would need if you're a geologist, but you are going to get enough to at least be able to look at a rock and understand to some degree how it may have been formed um, and what that tells us about the ancient environment in which it did form. So um, I understand this is rocks. When I was in eighth grade and when I was in high school and I took earth science, I thought rocks were the dumbest thing on planet Earth, and why would anyone care? So um, I want you to know I empathize with you if you're not totally into this. Um, so that's also, too, why I'm trying to keep this kind of down to the nitty gritty. All right. OK, end of rant. Let's go on ahead and get into this. So there are three different types of rocks um, or categories of rocks, and there is igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Depending on the type of rock, it tells you where it formed, and depending on where it formed, lets you know the ancient environment and potentially maybe what lived there, so on and so forth. If it doesn't tell me what lived there, if it doesn't tell me what the ancient environment was, it at least gives me a hint at what the earth was doing, what the continent was doing, was a volcano erupting, something like that, okay? So um, the three different types of rocks tell us quite a bit, um, both about the environment that the rocks were laid down in, but also to what has happened to the rocks since they were created. And that really gets into metamorphic and sedimentary rocks, which I'll get into here in a minute. Okay, so igneous rocks. Igneous rocks come from volcanoes. Igni means fire, okay? So if you've ever played the Witcher games, you know that you can shoot fire at some of the monsters with the igni symbol. Okay, well, igni just means fire, and that's why it's fire in the game. Okay, so igneous rocks come from fire, i.e. magma. So there's three different types of igneous rock. There is igneous intrusive, which forms underground. Okay, there's plutonic rocks, which are kind of like the original rocks of the continents. They're deep, deep, deep underground, and they take millions and millions and millions of years, sometimes tens of millions of years, to uh, basically cool down and solidify into rock. And then there's extrusive, and extrusive, X meaning outside of, extrusive means it forms outside of Earth's uh, interior or on the surface. So this is what's coming from magma flows or lava flows. Actually, magma is for underground and lava is for above ground. So extrusive rocks form above ground. Now, there are ways to tell which rock is which. So for igneous um, rocks, some things to kind of figure out or some things to kind of know about igneous rocks, some characteristics of them is that these things have interlocking grains. Basically, all the different colors and little bits of minerals and stuff that are in them have all formed together. There is no cement. So each of the individual grains is formed into another grain, and that's formed into another grain, and that's formed into another grain, and they all just meld together, so to speak. In other rocks, you'll actually see a cement. So you'll see grains or minerals, but then you'll have like a cement that holds them all together. We'll get into that in a minute. These don't do that. All the grains are stuck together interlocking. 
There are no fossils in igneous rocks. I'm pretty sure there has never been a single instance on Earth where a fossil was preserved in an igneous rock because mm, lava and magma melt fossils. So um, if you find a fossil in a rock, it is not igneous. Um, a lot of times you'll get glassy textures like obsidian and other things um, that you don't get in the other types of rocks. Um, you'll also get a very coarse grain structure as well. So um, what I mean by that is if you rub your fingers on it and things like that, it can also be coarsely grained. So um, glassy or even coarse grained. And it's, it's, it's a spectrum, kind of like the light spectrum, right? Okay, these generally don't react with acids. Um, as a geologist, I carry around a little bottle of HCl, hydrochloric acid, and I'll squirt it on rocks if I'm not sure what they are. Generally, if it, if it bubbles, if the acid reacts, that means there's something uh, carbonaceous in it, something that you know used to have life in it, and that lets me know it's not igneous. Um, if it doesn't react with the acid, then it might be igneous. It might not be, but it's one thing that I can kind of take a look at to see whether or not it is or not. Um, again, the minerals will often grow in patches, and they tend to grow together interlocking. So if you look at the example of diorite on the screen, that, that uh, white and black peppery salt and pepper rock, you can see that there's, there's chunks of black and chunks of white, and they kind of grow together in groups. So you will actually see minerals growing and crystallizing in igneous rocks. Um, typically, your igneous rocks are hard to scratch with your fingernails or even like an actual nail. Um, so they tend to be fairly hard. Now, there are soft minerals in igneous rocks, but for the most part, they generally tend to be fairly hard on the Mohs hardness scale, so to speak. Okay. Um, igneous extrusive rocks are very, 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 very finely grained, like tiny little grains. And that is because they formed on the surface, so they cooled very quickly. So the minerals, which are all attracted to each other, so like silicon dioxide likes other silicon dioxide, and when they're in magma, they can move around and hold hands. And a whole bunch of them can hold hands, and then they create a big crystal of silicon dioxide or quartz. So when you have plenty of time to cool, that gives all of those minerals time to kind of latch on to the ones that are like each other, and grow into larger uh, grain sizes. Well, when you form above ground, the lava cools very quickly and there's not enough time to form those larger grains. So you get a much smaller grain size, okay? Um, some of them you can't see the individual minerals at all. So um, igneous extrusive, you're gonna see very small grains. Uh, some can have air bubbles trapped. So things like scoria or pumice, um, you can see on the screen here below, there's some rocks that look like they have holes in them. Well, that's because those came from lava on the surface of the uh, earth. Lava's hot, which basically means there's gases coming off of it that are rising. So there's actual gas trying to make its way out of that molten lava. And when it cools, it traps those air bubbles in there. And you can you know, see that there in the picture. Pumice has so much... Um, empty space inside of it from all the air bubbles that was you know, forming, that it will actually float on water. It's like the only one or two rocks that you can actually put on water and it will float um, because it's so, uh, well, it's not very dense. So anywho, um, these form basically from eruptions and um, examples would be basalt, obsidian, andesite, pumice, uh, scoria, as I already mentioned before, and some others, okay? Now we get into the intrusive rocks, and now you start getting into the what most people would think of as prettier rocks because you start to get larger grains. Intrusive rocks will cool over thousands or millions of years, sometimes even tens of millions of years. The longer it takes to cool, the larger the grain size because, again, those minerals like to find other similar minerals to themselves. And if the stuff stays molten for a longer period of time, that's just more time for all of those little minerals to find ones like themselves and continue to grow, okay? So when you see big mineral sizes like what you see here in this diorite, which is a salt and pepper looking rock, well, that lets you know because you can see how big those grains are, that, that formed underground. And that formed from magma, not lava, right? Because magma is underground, okay. 
Um, other things to mention about this, th these are basically being formed from igneous intrusions, which we talked about last week, um, or batholiths, which are just underground chambers of magma. That's where you will find igneous rocks, uh, igneous intrusive rocks. Now, these can be things like granite, diorite, gabbro, pegmatite. There's lots of different types of intrusive rocks. Okay, those are just a few that you might be familiar with. Okay, moving on. Plutonic rocks are basically intrusive rocks. They really don't need their own distinction, but um, when we do as geologists talk about plutonic rock versus intrusive rock, and all it means is plutonic rocks are like the rocks that were originally here on the continents before all these other things started forming on top of them. They're the very deepest of deep rocks. They did form from magma, and your plutonic rocks tends to be where all the minerals and gold and things that we're looking for, copper and all that, you'll find them in, in your plutonic rocks. Um, you don't find them generally in dikes, but sometimes you do. Anyways, um, these are going to be the same types of rock. They just have larger minerals um, because they took much, much, much longer to form or cool over time. All right. And that picture you see right there are basalt pillars. And that looks like something that people may have maybe have carved in the in the mountainside there, but actually basalt, if you give it enough time, will form in those perfectly hexagonal uh, pillars just like that. So it looks like, you know, like a cathedral or something. So uh, you find these all over the place. You can even find them um, in the old world in like Greece and uh, Rome and places like that, where there's a lot of basaltic volcanoes. So anywho. There you go. Those are your igneous rocks, your fire rocks, so to speak. Okay, that gets us into sedimentary rocks. Now, sedimentary rocks is all about trying to figure out how these things form to figure out the ancient environment. This is where you actually get information about the ancient environment stored in the rocks. And what sedimentary rocks are is they form from sediment. And sediment is just broken up bits of rock. That can be large chunks. That can be tiny little grains the size of silt, which you can almost barely see with the naked eye. You almost need a hand lens to be able to see. Okay, so sedimentary rocks are just forming from broken up rocks. That's it. Now, because of that, that gives us a hint as to where they formed. Because in order to weather away rock and then go put it somewhere, you need water. So sedimentary rocks form from the sediment that's carried by water, either from rainfall from rivers, from lakes, from oceans, and this allows the sediment all to gather in a spot, percolate down, and then over time compact because more stuff is coming in on top of it and then form a rock. Um, some of the things that we look for in sedimentary rocks are grain size. The bigger the grains, the less time it has taken to basically weather or break down. If I have really, really big chunks of uh, grains of like, you know, bits of rock and things like the breccia or the conglomerate at the top there, well, those came from a high energy environment, i.e. the water's moving by very quickly. Um, those probably came from the base of a mountain or somewhere where a plate is smashing up and breaking up those bits of rock. Because I, I and I know that because if they had had time to move down river and weather down into smaller grains that would be much, much further away from the initial area where they broke up. Okay, so um, the more angular the grains are, so like that breccia there, you see it's very sharp angles of the grains that formed very close to the boundary where that was breaking up. The conglomerate with the rounded stuff on the left there you see those are nice and rounded. Well, those probably broke up and traveled a little ways down a river and that tumbling slowly rounded them out. So it lets me know that those aren't in the exact place where they formed and they've had time to weather. So there was a lot of time in between the time that those rocks, those little tiny pebbles and things formed to the time where they are now that have been all nice and rounded and weathered out, okay? Um, Looking at the composition of the rocks inside of the conglomerate, the breccia can tell me what, what rock group may have been broken up to form that. And I can go further upstream to go find that exact particular rock layer, so on and so forth. 
typically breccias, breccias we're finding at plate boundaries where things are smashing together and growing. Conglomerates can form there and then you know that weather away, or they tend to form in the mountains where mountains are just simply weathering away from rainwater and snow and ice and things like that. So anyways, point being, it tells us a lot about it. Um, with sedimentary rocks, you have to have a depositional environment. So you actually have to have water moving somewhere um, to be able to move these grains and deposit them. Or you can be in a desert, and that's technically a depositional environment because there's just sand everywhere. And we do get aeolian sandstones, which are just dry sandstones. They've formed in a desert, okay? But for the most part, you have to have water, and you have to have a depositional environment where sediment's being laid down. Cool. All right. Um, this is the type of rock that you find fossils in. 99 times out of 100, if you find a fossil in a rock, it's a sedimentary rock, okay? Because the thing has to die and then be covered up by sediment. If it's covered up by lava, it melts. So it's not gonna work, right? So 99 times out of 100, it's going to be a sedimentary rock. There's one exception and it's when it might be a metamorphic rock. We'll get into that in a minute. Okay, sedimentary rocks you might have heard of. Sandstone, limestone, I just said conglomerate, silt stones, which form at the very, very bottoms of oceans and lakes and things like that. All right, fun stuff. Okay, now, Grain size, I kind of mentioned this already with the conglomerates, I won't repeat that. But the smaller the grain, the lower energy environment it formed. So if I have tiny little things that I can barely see with my eye, that probably formed in the deep ocean, or it formed at the very bottom of a lake, in the middle of the lake, or it formed at the very bottom of a pond in the middle of a pond. Here's what I mean by low energy. If water is moving, it's carrying sediment. If it's moving fast, it's going to carry larger grains. If it's moving very slowly, it can carry only the smaller grains. And you know this, go outside, take a hose, spray it on the ground, gently watch what moves, then turn that jet up and really hit the ground and the dirt and watch yourself just make a hole, right? If you turn it to the shower function where it's nice and gentle, it's not taking stuff with it, right? So the higher the energy, the greater the grain size, the larger the grain size. The lower the energy, the smaller the grain size. So siltstones, shales, things with very tiny grains forming at the bottoms of oceans and things like that, where waves can't sit there and turn it up and mix it up and all that, okay? Awesome. Um, already mentioned rounded grains. That means if it's, that it's a lot older, it's had a lot more time to uh, basically weather away. If it has angular grains, well, then it hasn't had that much time to weather down and it formed into that rock very quickly after it was broken apart. So lots of stuff that we can learn. Other things, composition. If it bubbles to acid, that means it's probably got dead living or dead creatures that are inside of it somewhere. Um, sands, if it's got sand in it, it probably came from a beach, a river, or a desert. And there's ways to figure out, you know, the difference between them. Stones and pebbles tend to form in ri rivers or at the bottoms of mountains where there's erosion happening. Uh, coal, well, that's an ancient environment. That's a dead forest. So if it's made up of coal, we know that that formed in a forest somewhere in the ancient environment. Rare minerals um, will give us an idea of where that sediment came from. So if I know that there is gold in a mountain 300 miles west and I'm finding little gold sediments uh, in a river that runs through those same mountains, well, I can assume that gold came from there. So we can actually use trace elements or rare minerals to get an exact location of where the sediment from that rock may have come from. Um, fossils are always a good indicator of, of what environment we're looking at. If it has little tiny sh shells and things like that, well, we know it's a marine environment, a water environment. Um, if I start getting things like dinosaur bones in there, well, then it's a terrestrial environment it formed on land, and chances are it was a river that covered up the dead thing. So, um, and then halite. Halite is just salt. If I get like salt deposits and things like that, well, it's probably a dried up salt water river, uh, lake, ancient seaway, something like that. So the composition can tell us quite a bit. And then the structures, and don't worry, this is the last one for sedimentary rocks here. The structures that are locked up inside of 
these sedimentary rocks can tell us quite a bit. If you look up here at uh, A, you can see these cross forms here, these wave, um, the, the cross bedding here. Um, this is indicative of a very particular environment. This more braided form here is indicative of a different environment. So a lot of Aeolian sandstones, the ones that form in, um, in deserts, will look a lot like this. Ones that form in the ocean, kind of on the bottom in that area where you still get sunlight, but you're not getting a whole lot of wave motion to turn up the sediment, you get something more like F. You see these little structures are burrows from the different creatures that live in the sediment and stick their little filter feeders up. So things like um, your oysters and stuff, they burrow down into the, into the sediment and they stick their little, their little filter feeding tongue up and they'll sit there and filter feed. And when something dangerous comes, they shoot their, their tongue back into their shell, close it, and then they're under the ground, they're under the sediment. Well, we see these things preserved here and this right here. So that lets me know exactly where that formed. So there's lots of different structures, different shapes or patterns that will form that give us an idea of exactly where that rock formed. Now, we don't always get this lucky, but um, when we see things like this, it's, it's uh, a red herring, I guess. I don't know. It's a, it's a big flashing light. Like, hey, check this out. We know where this came from. All right. And just to give you an idea what I mean, so here is wave ripples that have been saved in the rock record. This is limestone or a sandstone here, probably a sandstone. And you can see these wave ripples. And here on this flowing bit of water on the beach here, you can see those same shapes start to form. So um, these things are preserved in the rock record. And when we see them, we know exactly where it came from. Anyways, that gets us on to metamorphic rocks. And this is the last rock type I'll talk about. And I'll move fairly quickly through this one. Metamorphic rocks form from igneous or sedimentary rocks, either or. And what happens is a metamorphic rock, just like a caterpillar metamorphoses, metamorphizes, it undergoes metamorphosis and becomes a butterfly. The same thing is true with metamorphic rocks. An igneous rock or a sedimentary rock can morph into a metamorphic rock. And what happens is we take sedimentary rock, we smash it together under immense pressure, and it will change. Or if we apply an extraordinary amount of heat to it without melting it, we can't melt it, but if we heat it up, we can actually get it to change its form. We can change the chemistry of the rock. So metamorphic rocks are rocks that have been changed into something else through extreme heat or pressure without melting it, okay? So an example would be marble. If you have limestone and you heat it and you put it under extreme pressure, it will turn into marble, that beautiful white rock. And this is the one time you will probably find a fossil that's not in a sedimentary rock. So a lot of times what will happen is limestone will get heated up or it'll get pressed really hard. It'll turn into your marble and there'll be a few fossils that still survive in the structure. So sometimes you can get a metamorphic rock with the fossil, but generally the heat and the pressure destroy all the fossils that may have been in that old sedimentary rock. So um, again, that's why sedimentary rocks and fossils, they're linked. Um, so anyways, that's all you need to know about metamorphic rocks. Basically, they've been changed from heat and pressure. You'll see all sorts of squiggly lines and things like that from that rocks folding and, and getting all mashed up and everything else. So when you see rocks that have these squiggly lines like this, it's a metamorphic rock. And that lets you know what has happened to that rock since it was put down. Doesn't tell you anything about the rock and the environment it was put in originally, but it lets you know what has happened to it since. And if you know how to get to that rock, well, you can work your way back and go, yeah, anyways, I think you get the point. Hopefully you do. Anywho, so to give you an idea, sandstones can get turned into quartzite. So those red quartzites that I talked about, those pink quartzites that I talked about in the History of Earth video that you find around here, those used to be sandstone and then they got smashed and turned into quartzite. 
um, basically you go from a sandstone where all the grains are stuck together with cement and after it's been pressed together the grains will actually grow together they'll actually kind of start to ignore the cement and form together um, all the sand essentially becomes crystals that lock as opposed to just being stuck there in cement um, if you go from say a shale or a granite and you mash it up you can slowly go from a schist or into a nice same thing, limestone into a marble. There's different ways to get to different types of rocks. So anywho, metamorphic rocks, that's what they are. Now, I've been talking around this concept right here. And this is the last slide, as you guys can tell. So you've made it to the end. Thank you for listening to the long ramble about rocks. So here's the thing to know. And this is the point of learning about those different types of rocks. There's a thing called the rock cycle. And the rock cycle just talks about how one rock goes to another rock goes to another rock. So if you look at the one on the right, you can see that I have magma, igneous, uh, sediment, sedimentary, and metamorphic. And then it shows you with the arrows how to get to each one. So if I start off with a sedimentary rock and I apply heat and pressure, I go to a metamorphic rock. If I add more heat until it melts, well, now I'm magma. And then I have to cool, and when I do, I turn it into an igneous rock. If I take an igneous rock and heat it up again until it melts, it goes back to magma, cools, and goes back to an igneous rock. If I weather an igneous rock, so I break it down into little bits, it turns into sediment. I can do the same thing with metamorphic rock. I can weather it down and turn it into sediment. I can do the same thing with sedimentary rock. I can weather it down and turn it back into sediment. But once I have sediment, if I have enough of it and I have enough time, and enough pressure, I can turn it back into a sedimentary rock. So this seems like a really simple thing you would tell fifth graders, and it is. Now, the nuance of how to use this tool, just like with a hammer, um, you know, everybody knows you can hammer nails with a hammer, but that's not all you can do with a hammer. So right now you're kind of getting like the, hey, this is how you hammer nails with a hammer type lecture here, but just know you can do a lot more things with the rock cycle and understanding um, what has happened to the rocks over time. Um, so you're getting the tool, I'm giving you the hammer um, and I'm showing you how to do the nails, but just know you can also slowly mold uh, helmets out of metal with a hammer and you can do all sorts of stuff, right? Okay, so you're just getting that little glimpse here. Now, um, right here on this picture off to the left, you can see where some of these things form. Your igneous rocks are forming at your uh, divergent boundaries. They're forming in volcanoes, obviously, which are being formed from the melting of these subducted plates. They move up, they put their magma up on the surface of Earth, so that's where they form. Your metamorphic rocks tend to form at collisional boundaries. So wherever one continental plate is smashing up against another one, right here is where you're going to get metamorphic rocks. Um, anywhere where there's pressure from plates pushing against each other, you're going to get metamorphic rocks. You're also going to get metamorphic rocks and the rock over here and the rock over here that's near the magma, but it's not being melted by the magma, right? So when you're getting uh, volcanoes and stuff popping up, well, where that magma burned through to get to the surface, the surrounding rock will all be metamorphosed. It will have changed um, due to that heat. So um, that's where you tend to find those. Sedimentary rocks you're finding, you know, in any environment where sediment abounds. So that's kind of basically everywhere. Um, but anyways, that's the rock cycle and that's rocks. And hopefully, to some extent, you have just a wee little bit more respect for those hard, rocky things that are just thrown about your driveway, right? All right. So um that's a rock cycle um hopefully may maybe now when you're looking at those rocks in your driveway or in your garden or when you're on a trip to colorado you can maybe kind of start piecing together what it is you're looking at um i'm not expecting you all to be geologists here but you know hey there you go you know a little bit more about the natural world and dumb rocks all right i'm shutting up now talk to you guys later